is on prophecy. We're looking at the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2 and 3. And uh, homing in here on chapter 2 with the book uh, with the church of Ephesus. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for loving us. Lord, thank you, Lord, for sending your word into our life. And Lord, uh, it's just so amazing and the the depth of it and the, only you could have put it together, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for sending your word into my life, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you do what I cannot do, and that is to speak to the hearts of each and every person here, Lord. I pray that you give me the spirit of teaching and, uh, Lord, uh, uh, make, the, make uh, it easy to understand the uh, this um, these chapters here on Ephesus, Lord, and and Lord, we just ask all this for your honor and your glory in Jesus' name, Amen. So last week we talked about Ephesus, and uh, <clears throat> we talked about um, there was three things that the church of Ephesus uh, uh, had here. Well, let me just read it uh, in in chapter two, verse number one. It says, "Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things: saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks." And so we talked about that in in this uh, economy here in the future, this these churches that are in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, in uh, chapter two and three of Revelation, uh, they have an angel. Uh, that's uh, and the, the angel's going to work like it did back in the Old Testament, and we don't see angels here in the New Testament. Even though there is, Paul did say that uh, beware uh, that we entertain angels unaware, but we don't have an angel directly coming to us and giving us message from God, uh, or involved in our church or involved in our lives. Uh, but over here in the tribulation, it's going to be different. Uh, we see angels preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, each church has its own angel. And so we covered that last week. And then in verse number two, it says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how that thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. So we talked about these three things that the Lord commends this church on. Uh, he commended them on their works and their labor and their patience. And we we looked at those three words. Those three words are those three elements that should be in every believer's life. Uh, and we find them throughout the Bible. This is what we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and be judged on, I believe, these three things right here. And we looked in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. That's the first time they show up in the Bible. It talks about faith, hope, and charity. And that's what Paul was stressing to this church that these people need to have, faith, hope, and charity. And he said the greatest of these is charity. And then we're given a little bit more information on it in the book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, where it talks about, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 3, it says, Remember without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, these three elements here are expanded on a little bit here. We see it, it's not just uh, faith, but it's a work of faith. We see that it's not just hope, but it's a, a, a hope of in our Lord Jesus Christ, a patience of hope. And charity, of course, is the labor of love. So we see the progression here, and it's into more detail, more descriptive uh, of what we need to have in our lives. But if you'll notice, when you get over to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse number 2, there's things missing. It says, I know thy works. There's no mention of faith here. He just says, I know thy works. And then it says, and thy labor. Well, there's no mention of love here. And thy patience. And there's no mention of hope. And I believe the reason why they are lacking these things is found in verse number 4, where it says, nevertheless, I have someone against thee because... Thou hast left thy first love. So they were lacking the faith. They were lacking the love. And they were lacking the hope. They had, they had, uh, they had the works. Uh, they had the labor. And they were working hard. And they were laboring. And they had patience. But they were, they were ma lacking the charity. They were lacking the faith. They were lacking the hope. The main elements. And I believe that was because they took their eyes off the Lord. Uh, they left their first love. And it, it no longer became for him and about him. But it, it's kind of like, okay, this is what you want us to do. We see in your word what you want us to do. Okay, we can do it without you. We don't need your help. 
we can accomplish your mission that you've given to us without you. That's kind of the idea of what was going on here. And But I want to point out one other thing here. It says uh, in verse number 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and that thou hast found them liars. And so I just want to kind of dive in here on the word apostle and what that means and everything it represents in the word of God. So in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse number 8, we're told that God gave gifts unto men. And then later on in Ephesians, chapter 4, verse number 11, uh, we see that he gave those having certain of these gifts to be leaders in the church. And we see this again in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter um, 12, verse number 28. The Bible says, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers. So you see there's an order here. And this is in the book of 1 Corinthians. So we're in a church age book here, and he's talking about apostles. So let's talk about the gift of an apostle. Let me give you the definition of the word apostle. And it's derived from the Greek word apostolos. And of this Greek word, uh, uh, Bullinger wrote this. He said, apostolos, primarily an adjective, sent forth, then a sub substitute, one sent, a messenger, an ambassador, an envoy, an apostle from apostolos to send off or to send away from. It occurs in John 18.16, 2 Corinthians 8.23, and Philippians 2.25. So that's the definition, a sent one. That's the definition of apostle, one who's sent, sent from God. In the New Testament, the, the 12 disciples specifically chosen by Christ were called apostles. Still, there were others called apostles who were not of the 12. And you'll find this throughout Scripture, like Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 14, verse number 14. Today, we would call these missionaries. Uh, from the Latin word, missa, missio, missio, I guess that's how you say it meaning one sent forth by authority. And as they are called by God and sent forth from a local assembly of believers, the church, they are to go where there are no churches for the purpose of establishing a new work. Now, we see this displayed in Romans chapter 1, verse number 5. It says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. In particular, I believe that this should generally follow Paul's example. Uh, to go where people have no knowledge of, of Christ. Uh, however, the term today is generally used in a broader sense, uh, so as to include starting churches or involved in other ministries that um, are what we call parachurch organiza organizations uh, or, or some kind of thing that's not even involved with the church. And have nothing to do with the gift of apostle at all, but we still are under the umbrella of the word missionary. Romans chapter 15, verse number 20 through 21 says this, Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, uh, <clears throat> not when Christ was named, lest I should be among other men's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and that they have not heard shall understand. Now, this this may not be what, what you have were taught or heard before, but think about it. What spiritual gift qualifies a man to hold the office of a bishop? Well, obviously, it's the gift of a pastor. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. <clears throat> then what spiritual gift qualifies a man to be a missionary? Some would say it would be the gift of an evangelist, but... In the Bible, evangelists do not start churches. As a matter of fact, in the, the only biblical account of evangelists that we have in the Bible uh, says this in Acts chapter 8, verse number 14. And when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Philip had the gift of an evangelist. In Acts chapter 21, verse number 8, we see that. He preached at Samaria. Samaria and, uh, and all, the Bible says, they gave heed and believed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's found in Acts chapter 8, uh, verses 10 through 14. So he was sent to Samaria, and he preached, and they believed on Jesus Christ, and they heard him, and they received him well, and they got saved. 
So then the apostles of Jerusalem, because there's people getting saved over here in, in Samaria, <clears throat> the, so the, the apostles at Jerusalem sent Peter and John to Samaria to establish a church. We find that in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. So no longer needed, God sent the evangelists to minister elsewhere. He, he, he sent Philip to another place. To, to do what he was called to do, be an evangelist and evangelize and win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Remember, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. He's the one who does it. Now, nowhere in the New Testament is the word missionary found. You're not going to find it in the Bible. <clears throat> so where do we get this word? Well, in the New Testament, we see a word called apostle. As, as the word baptize is a transliteration of a word of the Greek uh, we get our word uh, baptized from the word bab baptizo. Uh, it's just a Greek word that was in the Bible that we pulled out of there, the King James translators did, and stuck it in, the, in our English translations. So when we, you actually are saying the word baptized, you're actually speaking a Greek word. It's not even an English word. So the same thing, the word apostle is a transliteration of the word apostolos. But... It's not in English. It's in Latin. Remember, in, in the first century, the Bible was translated into Latin, and the King James translators used that Latin word, mis, mis, misarios, to make missionary, uh, and, and, uh, and used that instead, if that makes any sense. It seems clear that the word missionary from the Latin Bible, therefore it seems clear that a missionary is nothing more than an apostle. It's the same word. I believe God has allowed a, a, us to use the Latin word missionary instead of the Greek word apostle to distinguish what a missionary is today and not to confuse it with the original 12 apostles. They, had, they were in a different dispensation. They had a different uh, uh, ministry. They, they, they had uh, signs and wonders that let people know that they were given the word of God because the canon of scripture had not been completed yet. And, and so there were other apostles that were sent from God, uh, but we use the term missionary for those uh, apostles, and so not to confuse. I think God did it that way, so it doesn't confuse you with, with uh, those that had signs and wonders and were in a different dispensation. Uh, during the time when the, the kingdom message was being preached to Israel, the authority of the 12 apostles was validated by miracles and signs. Today, their authority is validated by a local church who sent them out recognizing their callings and gifts to that ministry. So that church ordains them. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 7 says, Whereunto I am ordained, a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Furthermore, Paul told the Corinthian church that they themselves were proof that he was an apostle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 2, it says, If I not be not an apostle unto others, Yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostle, apostleship are ye in the Lord. And what is more proof of an apostle's gift and calling than the souls that he won and the churches that he established by the Holy Spirit through his labor? So, here is a brief description of what I believe to be the work and ministry of an apostle, a missionary. Missionaries are called to the ministry of God. Now, I am a missionary, so uh, I, I believe I have a little handle on this subject. When it comes to missionaries, I've studied it out, and I believe missionaries are called to the ministry by God. It's a God-ordained call from, from himself that he places. He leads by desire. He puts this desire in your heart, and he calls you. If you're called to be a preacher, if you're called to be a missionary, if you're called to be an evangelist, if you're called, you will know it. <laughs> There'll be no doubt in your mind. There'll be no doubt in your heart. This is what God has called me to do. Acts chapter 13, verse number 3 says this, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. It's interesting to note that these men were already busy serving the Lord in the church. They were already busy doing whatever they could. And God said, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work I've called them. He called them while they were doing the work. And I remember when uh, I, I went to Bible college, <clears throat> that was my story. Man, I got involved with everything I could get involved with. I joined the choir. I was teaching uh, 
Sunday school. I was working in the prison ministries. I was working in the juvenile correction facilities. I was preaching in chapel. I was doing a bus route. I was whatever I could find to do. I was busy doing it. My life was church. And God put his call on my life while I was busy serving the Lord. I mean, I knew I was called of God, but I didn't know where and what and why. But he put all that in my heart and showed me what he wanted me to do while I was busy serving him. And I think that's the way it's going to pretty much always work. I mean, there may be some exceptions to the rule, but I believe that God's not going to call anybody outside of the church, and he's not going to call anybody that's not doing anything for him. It's also interesting to note that when the church called them out, that they fasted and they prayed. Man, today you don't, you don't, you don't see that. I just taught a class on fasting and prayer, and uh, today when we have uh, people who are getting ordained, instead of fasting, we throw a feast, <laughs> have a big party. That's not the way it happened back in, in the, early, the beginning of the early church. They fasted and they prayed. Because why? Because they wanted to make sure that before they ever had leaders or they ever sent people out, that they wanted to make sure this was God's will and God's hand was upon them and that when they stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, that they did everything in accordance to the Holy Ghost. And so it was something very, very, very serious to them. That's why they fasted and they prayed. Today... I think we just kind of look for talent and, oh, yeah, you, you can, you're good with words. Let's make you a preacher. And we have a lot of mama called, daddy sent um, preachers. But <clears throat> back then, it was vital. It was vital that God had called you and he put his hand upon you and the church wanted to make sure of that. <clears throat> and obviously, you can see by the condition of the churches in the world today uh, that there's a lack of God's power in people's life, and I believe it's because there's a lack of fasting, there's a lot, lack of prayer. But number two, missionaries should be sent by a local church. Acts chapter 13, verse number three says, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away, talking about the church. The laying on of hands signifies the church recognize, recognition on their calling and identification with them as their representatives. So it's like saying, you go out and represent who we are and what we believe to them, and we're putting our hands on you in recognition that God has called you and that you are basically not just an ambassador for Christ, but you also represent this church. <clears throat> Note, they, they, the church, sent them, not a mission board. Um, now, I'm not sent through a mission board, However, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with mission boards. I just don't think the Lord wanted me to go that direction uh, uh, for several reasons. I'm not, it doesn't really pertain to the topic here at hand, but they're kind of a parachurch organization. I, I kind of raise my eyebrow and wonder when somebody wants to come up alongside me and say, hey, we want to help you. Okay, well, what's in it for you? <laughs> I, I think kind of God has put the burden of a mission board on the local church. I know that I was sent out through a local church and uh, uh, they took care of all of my funds, everything that came in. I, I went around and raised support. That was all handled by the church and they sent it out to me. But one thing it did was it got that church excited about missions because man, one of their own, me, who was out of their church was going to the mission field and it just seemed to bring a spirit of excitement about that church. And I think a church that doesn't do that is robbed of that. And, and man, if there's no excitement, if there's no burden for the mission field in a local church, oh, man, it's going to soon go out. That fire's going to go out. So, number three, missionaries should be led by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 13, verse number four says, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto uh, uh, Cecilia from thence they sailed to Cyprus. The church sent, but did not dictate the actual place of service. That's God's business. God's the one who lays it on the missionary's heart, where to go and what to do. The church just acknowledges that calling and sends them away and, and helps them however they can. Number four, missionaries intend to establish churches. That's her job, establishing churches ordaining elders and training for the for for the work that that that's being uh, conducted there uh, think of uh, Paul 
That's exactly what he did with Titus. He said, listen, I want you to go out and I want you to find bishops and deacons and people whom we could ordain to be over these churches. That was his job. Acts chapter 14, verse number 23 says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commanded them, uh, commended them unto the Lord on whom they believed. This is the work of an apostle. This is what Paul sent Titus to do, to do this very same thing. We're, we're establishing the churches, and we need to have a form of government in these churches, so people need to be ordained. And so that is the work of a missionary to do. Uh, he has the authority to ordain people. He has the authority to do that because that is what God has sent him to do, to establish a church. And so we ordain elders, we ordain bishops, we ordain deacons, we ordain leaders in the church. That is the job of a missionary. Number five, missionaries continue to care for the churches that they have established through a loving relationship with the pastor. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 28 says this, Besides those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. Paul had established as a missionary several churches, and so he was not the pastor of those churches, but that did not mean that the love of those churches was not still in his heart, and he still cared for those churches. He still, I mean, he, he, he called these people that he won to the Lord his children, and he was a father unto them, and he cared for them. He prayed for them. He wanted to see them succeed, and so he helped them. Man, he asked other churches to help send money to these churches over there. He was looking out for their welfare, and I believe as a missionary, uh, that's one of the responsibilities as you get later on uh, into your ministry and you've established several churches. You're going to care for them. You're going to pray for them. You're going to want to help them. You're, you're going to have a love for them in your heart because, man, your blood, sweat, and tears went into that. And so that's going on here. You want to care for the churches. Number six, missionaries report to their churches. Acts chapter number 14, verse number 26 and 27 says, And there sailed to Antioch from whence... They held, had been missionaries to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how they had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. That's, uh, that's why missionaries send out newsletters. And uh, I send out a newsletter every quarter to all the churches that support me. And I let them know what's going on in my life. I let them know what's going on in my ministry. I let them know what's going on in Hawaii, people getting saved, what God is doing. Uh, if there's problems or needs, I let them know that in the newsletters. But basically, I try to keep it uplifting. I try to uh, make sure God gets the glory out of everything that's done here. And I want them to see, because I'm representing them who sent me out, what's going on here on the mission field so they could better pray for me, they can better uh, rejoice with me, and uh, uh, whatever needs to be done in that. Uh, uh, I, a couple of weeks ago, I, I went to a, a church in Texas because we were uh, everybody's uh, doing their services online now, so I was ever able to do it through Zoom. And so the pastor uh, in, invited me to come preach at his church through Zoom. So I was here, still in here in Hawaii, but I preached to them in Texas. And so uh, they were very excited about what God was doing. They had just gotten my newsletter, so he called me up and said, hey, can you share this with my people? Because I think it would be better coming from you. So I got to explain to them uh, what was in my newsletter. And I also said, hey, you guys want to see Hawaii? And they were like, yeah. So I took them out back uh, here and showed them, uh, uh, the, just walked them around and showed them kind of what Hawaii looks like. And they were all excited about it. But that's what the church wants to know, what their missionaries are doing. They want to know what's, what God is doing somewhere else. And that's why we as missionaries got to report back to them. And uh, I, 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 I know preachers that will drop a missionary real fast if they don't respond, if they don't send newsletters, if they don't let them know what is going on. So the apostol apostol apostolic requirements, here's what these are to be one of the company of the 12 apostles. Remember, this, this, these are sent ones. They would cl be classified, yes, as missionaries, I guess, but we use a different word, apostle, because they had kind of a different ministry. <clears throat> the 12 apostles, as found in Luke chapter 6, verse number 13, says this, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. One must have seen the 
resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, verse number 21 through 22 says, Wherefore, of these men which have been um, companied with us all, the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So that's one of the qualifications. You had to been part of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry, and you had to witness his ascension. It says that they also had to be men, which have, uh, have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out, out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto the same day that he was taken up from us. First Thessalonians chapter number 1 verse number 12 says, Apostles were also given uh, for the power to perform signs and wonders like Peter and John in Acts chapter number 3. They were able to raise a layman uh, from, from, from up. Remember when Peter and, and John uh, were going into the temple and there was one crying for alms and he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such I give unto thee. And he took him by the hand, lifted up, and he went into the temple leaping and rejoicing. <clears throat> and, and shouting hallelujah. And, and that was a miracle that was done. It was a sign. It was a wonder. We don't do stuff like that today. As a missionary, I don't, I don't heal anybody. I don't, uh, I don't make somebody's withered hand be restored again. That was a sign that was given to specifically to the 12 apostles because they were given the word of God. It was like God's stamp of authority. Yes, these guys are speaking my word and we don't have a written Bible now, but we know that they're speaking God's word because of the miracles that they were doing. They literally were raising people from the dead. Acts chapter 9. Remember that the uh, that these uh, were apostles, uh, uh, Jews, not they're to the Jews, not to the Gentiles, and they're preaching a different message. They're preaching the kingdom of God. They're preaching. They weren't preaching the kingdom of, I'm sorry, they weren't preaching the kingdom of God. They're preaching the kingdom of heaven. They're talking about when Jesus Christ comes back here and sets up his kingdom. That is the same message that the apostles and the people are going to be preaching in the book of Revelations, chapter number two and chapter number three. They're going to be preaching about the kingdom. In this, the church age, there are no more signs and there are no more wonders. Because of those signs and those wonders were for the unbelieving nation of Israel, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 22. Those signs were for, um, for the entire nation of Israel. The office of an apostle is still valid uh, for the church. It's still a valid gift of God to the church. Today, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12. Remember, this is a Pauline apostle here. And it says that they are just called missionaries. <clears throat> Today, instead of apostles, when the church is raptured out of this, this world, these apostles uh, uh, come on the scene preaching the gospel of the kingdom with signs and wonders. Along with these apostles come 144,000 Jews that are going to be preaching the kingdom of heaven and the two witnesses and also angels. They're all going to be preaching the same message in this dispensation. So we're in the dispensation of, of, of the grace of God, the church age. Nobody's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven now. We talk about it, but we're not preaching uh, that it's that we're not preaching it to get saved. They will in the next dispensation. Right now, we're preaching about the kingdom of God, and that God, uh, everybody can be a part of His spiritual kingdom by becoming born again. That's what we're preaching. So <clears throat> it says says here that. And has tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and has found them liars, over in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 2. Matthew chapter 24, verse number 24 says this, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonder, insomuch that if it were possible, that they should re deceive the very elect. So, <clears throat> they're trying these apostles, even though they're coming with signs and wonders and miracles. In, in the tribulation time. There's people that are doing this. <clears throat> but they're trying them because they're saying they're apostles because there are also false apostles that are also doing signs and they're also doing wonders. Why? So that they can deceive many people. And uh, so these, this church here is saying, okay, you're doing signs, you're doing miracles, but is what you're saying line up with the word of God? <clears throat> Jesus spoke of these, and Paul spoke of these. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13-15, it says, For such are false apostles, 
deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The apostles were able to do signs, miracles, and wonders according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. It says, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you, and all patient in signs and wonders and in mighty deeds. Satan's false ministers are going to be able to counterfeit those signs and wonders in the tribulation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, We're talking about the Antichrist here, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Satan himself is going to enter in, into a, a, a being, a human being here in on this world during the tribulation. He's going to be called the Antichrist in the Bible. And he's going to be able to do signs and miracles and wonders. The Bible says lying wonders. They're going to be false wonders. They're not even going to be real. And, and he's going to call call fire down from heaven. He's going to deceive many. And his, his ministers are going to be able to do the same thing and deceive many. But this church here in Ephesus, it says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Their signs, their lying wonders. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't line up with scripture. They didn't line up with what God said these people are going to be. They were false Christ. They were false apostles. And this church, God commends them on, hey, listen, you're doing a good work. You have patience, uh, and, and you're laboring, you're working hard, and you have tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So basically this lesson, I just wanted to home in on that word apostle there, because I believe it's used in every single dispensation. <clears throat> However, we call it, we would use the word missionary today, uh, because it's, it's a transliteration from the word that went into Latin, Missionarios, and I think God did that on purpose because He doesn't want us to be confused with uh, the dispensation of the twelve apostles and their signs and their wonders and and what their purpose was and what the apostles' purpose is now in the age of grace. When we get into the tribulation, these seven churches are going to revert back to the same kind of apostleship that was given at Jesus' earthly ministry, and shortly after, when you get into the very first couple books of Acts, and they're going to be able to do signs and wonders so people will know that they are sent from God. They are God's messengers. They are God's apostles. They are God's missionaries into this world. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. I pray, Lord, that, uh, Lord, everybody could understand it, Lord, and that, uh, Lord, that your spirit, Lord, just... Uh, uh, Lord, taught us, Lord, and we ask all this for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.